Let me pray for us, and we will begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, another day to breathe your ear, your air, uh, walk on your earth, uh, and entrust ourselves to you all over again. You are eminently trustworthy. Uh, we we have known from your word and by your Holy Spirit enough about you to cast all our eggs into the basket of trusting you. You have never lied, you never will. You have never balked on your promises, and you never will. And we are imminently untrustworthy. We are fallible in our knowledge, finite in our acquisition of information. We forget the things that we have known, and we are so often tainted by misunderstandings and untruths. If there is one in this conversation to be trusted, it is you and not us. And we pray that you would help us to distrust ourselves and to trust you implicitly. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning's title for Equipping Hour is Self-Trust. That is the topic we'll be looking at this morning. And by way of an outline, it is simply this. Don't. That's it. No complicated outline, no subplots. That's what we're doing this morning. We, we need to do some work, some homework in our Bibles and some homework in our hearts to dispel from us the idea that we are worth trusting. And, and this goes against the grain. I spent some time this week looking up the 10 deadliest diseases I'm not going to name any of them because you're already afraid of them. And if, an I, if I name them, you will have already thought of eight and you'll add two more to the list. We'll all be hypochondriacs. I have to admit, it didn't make the list of 10, but the, the flesh-eating bacteria is just fascinating. I hope you haven't been accosted by it. The brain-eating amoeba that you can get from swimming in a lake, you'll never swim in a lake again just by hearing me say these things. They can assault us with fears. And like I said, we're all going to be hypochondriacs thinking about these things. But there is a disease whose deadly effects far outweigh all of those deadliest ones we can think of. It is an infection in each of us. It is an infection that we are all born with. It is an effect, infection that is systemic. Uh, it is irreparable, incurable as long as we walk this earth. But its effects can be mitigated. And, and this morning, I want to encourage us to think about the remedies that we must strive for to mitigate the effects of self-trust. Uh, we'll be spending some time this morning in Proverbs 3, uh, some familiar verses, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. But I want to begin our time this morning in Philippians chapter 3, because the gospel itself assaults our self-trust. To be a follower of Jesus Christ, to, to have sins forgiven, to have an entrance into the Christian life is fundamentally to distrust yourself, to distrust the path that you had been on prior to Christ, to distrust and disassociate yourself from your own righteousness, from your own achievements, from your own way of thinking, from the way that seemed right to you, but the end was death. And so Philippians 3 gives us this autobiographical picture from the Apostle Paul, where he shows us this very thing. He says, I myself would have confidence in the flesh, Philippians 3, beginning in verse 4. If anyone else had a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Um, this is the place where Paul one-ups the storyteller of self-righteousness. I did this and this and this for God. And Paul says, oh yeah, I did more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. And, and Paul goes from the, the broad to the narrow in terms of achievements of his lineage, his pedigree, his accomplishments. 
Circumcised the eighth day meant he, he was a, a Jew according to the law. He was a, an actual genetic member of the nation of Israel, and he was of that beloved tribe Benjamin. I think there was a special place in the heart of Israel for the tribe of Benjamin, which was almost eradicated at one point. And Paul laid claim to that. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a way of saying uh, he was better than all the rest. And when it came to the law, he was a Pharisee, the strictest adherence. The one who did everything right outwardly and held everybody else accountable to it. The, the kind of man that Jesus said, your righteousness has to, has to exceed that kind or you're not getting into heaven. Paul took pride in all these things. He says, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. How committed was Paul to his self-achievement and his self-righteousness? He was willing to actually go after those who differed, put them in jail, bring about their death. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Paul there, as he's looking back on his former life, is not saying he never sinned, but he is saying in terms of his peers, in view of, of the way people could look at someone from the outside, nobody could blame Paul for breaking Mosaic law. He, he was the best of the best. He, he had done all of these things in strict adherence to what he trusted was the right path. And verse 7, you have the turn in his biography. Whatever things were gain to me, and he considered all of those as gain, I now have counted them loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God upon faith, so that I may know him. Paul's entrance into the Christian life is an entrance through the door of abandonment of self, an abandonment of self-trust, an abandonment of self-righteousness, an abandonment of human religion, an abandonment of achievement. It is an embracing by faith of the achievements of Christ. So with that as the backdrop, just thinking about self-trust at a fundamental level, if you're a Christian here this morning, you have become one by ceasing to trust yourself at the most important things. At the biggest level, you abandon self to follow Christ. You said, everything I had done up to this point is rubbish. Scubalon, says Paul, a, a word for vile filth. And I have embraced the beauty of Christ's righteousness in my place. In fact, in Romans 10, when Paul talks about the nation of Israel and his countrymen, his heart breaks for them. He says they're still trying to get a righteousness of their own doing. They're still trusting in themselves rather than trusting in Christ. So if you're a Christian here this morning, you have done this. Which means you've abandoned Disney as a worldview. Right, Disney says almost every Disney princess movie has something about follow your heart, <laughs> trust yourself. You, you've got the compass that tells you where to go. You shouldn't be listening to anybody but you. You, you abandon all of that when you came to Christ. So let's look at Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 this morning. I grew up in a church that did not preach the gospel, but we had a children's ministry and we sang songs. And, and one of the songs was this little ditty, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I'm not going to sing it for you now. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. I memorized it as a child and still have that version of it memorized to this day. There's something about putting uh, biblical lyric to melody that makes it stick. Well, it stuck for me as a ditty for a long time. And I was struck at one point when a mentor of mine said, ah, you know, Smed, you'll, you'll get out there on your own and, and one day you'll learn to trust yourself. I was horrified. I, I said, I don't think I ever want to do that. And I began looking through the scriptures for justification of that impulse, that reflex. I, I, something about that didn't sound right. Trusting myself? I don't know. 
Maybe I need to look through my Bible some. And, and, and I remember looking through the scriptures for, where's that verse that says, don't trust yourself? Surely there's one somewhere. And I ended up in the Proverbs, and I came across Proverbs 3, 5, and it says positively, trust in Yahweh with all your heart. And, and I had memorized this, and lean not. It, it sounds so positive. Trust in the Lord and lean not. But lean not is not just a childhood ditty in a song. It's a prohibition. Proverbs 3, 5b, the second half of this verse, actually says, don't trust yourself. Lean not on your own understanding is kind of a lyrical, poetical way to get at that. But I sort of reread this again in my late 20s and thought, oh, it actually says, don't trust me. It's a prohibition. Maybe it didn't strike you this way because you, you've always read it this way. For me, it was one of those, oh, this has been in my Bible the whole time. And it comes with the, 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 the promise, in all your ways acknowledge him, he'll make your path straight. The follow-up to that is a, is a blessing. This, this is more than a childhood ditty. This is a, a prohibition with depth. It's a positive command to trust Yahweh. It's a negative prohibition to not trust yourself. And what I want to do is, is just sort of take a, a little survey, a little stroll through the book of Proverbs where these, this same prohibition is said in some different ways uh, to give us a number of angles on this. So flip over to chapter 12 of Proverbs. Proverbs 12, 15. And we're going to turn this idea of self-trust over in our hand just a little bit to see its angles. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of an ignorant fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. And here we have one of the classic contrasts in Proverbs between wisdom and folly, between the wise person and the fool. And you have to understand that the fool in Proverbs is, is not a juggling clown, it's not some silly guy doing silly things. It's kind of pathetic. Oh, poor guy, he just doesn't know. The fool in Proverbs is the one who has intentionally rejected and suppressed God's wisdom in exchange for a life with the results of that rejection. He is a reprobate who has said, I don't want God to tell me what to do. I'm going to live life my own way. Uh, the, the fool is not a silly guy in Proverbs. The fool is a bad guy in Proverbs with a bad ending. And, and so here the, the, the wise man and the fool are contrasted. The wise man listens to counsel. But the way, the path, the, the, the life of an ignorant fool is right in his own eyes. Here's one of the remarkable things about this folly, this self-trust you end up thinking you're doing well. And the irony is other people on the outside could see the fool and his folly and the path that he's on and the destruction it leads to. And as he's on that path, as he's walking that path, as he's rejecting counsel, he says, yeah, this is the right way. And it's like those, those movies where the tension is built up and the main character is going into some dark room alone and, and everybody in the audience is thinking to themselves or maybe, maybe even saying out loud, don't go in there. No, this is right. And, and it is the fool who self-assesses his ignorant path, his rejected path, his rebellious path is right. And that phrase, in his own eyes. And this gets back to the disease that we're born with, the, the systemic corruption that is in all of us. What we see, what we think, what we perceive, what gets filtered through our ways of thinking seems right. It's really hard to be talked out of an opinion. It's really hard to be talked out of a judgment that you formed. Why? Because well, I formed it. I'm the one who, who formed this assessment, and, and how can I be taken from it? How can it be taken from me? 
the reality is I have good reasons for thinking what I'm thinking. I have my experiences for thinking what I'm thinking. I have my emotions that, that drive what I'm thinking. And, and so it's right in my own eyes. Turn over to chapter 14 and verse 12. There is a way, again, a path, a life path, which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. If you've ever been on one of the hiking trails in Arizona without the app, All Trails, you may have been in a place that seemed right to you. And if you're sitting here this morning, thankfully it didn't end in death, but it could have. <laughs> And what's fascinating about this little proverbial statement, it's so simple in what it says and, and so deep, so profound. There's a way that seems right to a man. Doesn't that get us? It, it seems right. It seems like what I'm doing is right. I'm on this path. I'm, I'm walking it. it. It's what I want to do. If, if I thought it was wrong, I wouldn't be doing it. If I thought it was unwise, if I, if I thought this would end in death, I, I think I'd pick another path. I'm pretty smart. And this idea of it seeming right is part of the self-deception which undermines self-trust. When you unmask what self-trust is, uh, you begin to see its dangers. And that will lead us to a remedy. Proverbs 16.25 uh, says the same thing for us. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is death. Flip over to Proverbs 20, verse 9. Who can say, I have kept my heart pure. I am clean from my sin. It's a rhetorical question. The, the, the answer is supposed to be, well, well nobody should. And yet we put forth our own rightness so easily. We excuse or self-justify. Uh, we are determined to put ourselves out there as in the right, to convince others that we are in the right. Uh, this is a, a natural impulse for us. This verse, by the way, is not addressing justification, positional uh, standing before God or sanctification. Uh, but it is encouraging us to keep a, an appropriate suspicion of our own hearts. All of us are tainted, at least for now in this life. Turn to Proverbs 21.2. Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but Yahweh weighs the hearts. Here the contrast is between our own self-trust, our own self-assessment, and what God sees. And God sees through our self-deceptions. And what's highlighted here in 21.2 is a ruling principle in the heart of man. What does man naturally do? What are, what are we naturally given to? Uh, thinking our own way is right in our own eyes. It is not natural for us to doubt ourselves. It's not natural for us to learn to be skeptical of our own rightness. In fact, this is how uh, all of, of the wicked life is perceived. The way that I'm going is, is right in my own eyes. And this gives us a hint at some of the remedy for mitigating the effects of this internal disease. Yahweh weighs the hearts. If I can't trust myself, to whom shall I turn? And we'll get there later this morning. But, but you already know the answer is Yahweh fundamentally. The maker and sustainer of your life is, is the one who will be trusted. He is the one that is trustworthy. I must learn to doubt myself. I must learn to be skeptical of my own perceptions. It doesn't mean you're always wrong. It just means you have the category of thinking you could be wrong. There's a humility in this abandonment of self-trust that is critical for us. Turn to chapter 26. In chapter 26, the first 11 verses tell us how foolish the fool is. 
The fool is really foolish with a bunch of poetic illustrations. And then in verse 12, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. And, and this has the rhetorical effect of building up our anticipation of, of looking at the rebellious fool going his own ways rather than God. And look how bad he is. No, it's worse than you think. It's worse than you think. It's like this and this and this. But someone who trusts himself is more hopeless even than the fool. This is like the, the height of folly, the, the king of fools, the one who trusts in himself, according to God. Proverbs 28, verse 26. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. There's kind of the bottom line. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. Trust yourself. Uh, that's foolish. Uh, what is the contrast there in verse 26? But he who walks wisely will escape. Uh, it's not told what, we, what he will escape, but the consequences of foolish living, the consequences of self-trust will be escaped if you abandon self-trust. Uh, the end of it is death, and then there are, are of course, temporal consequences. A really interesting one closes out the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 20. This is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats, she wipes her mouth, and says, I have done no wrong. So by her title... By her description here in this proverb, it is evident to all who would read this that she's guilty. And yet she sits down and eats and says, I haven't done anything wrong. There is a self-trust in the assessment of her character and her life and her behavior. Uh, there's a, a searing of the conscience, perhaps, that allows for this kind of self-trust. Or perhaps the self-trust builds the searing of a conscience. There's a phenomenon in, in the prison systems that everybody that's there, that's guilty of crime, sort of looks down on, on sort of a hierarchy of criminality within the prison system. In fact, there are, there are certain classes of criminals that are uh, put in different places because they'll be victimized by criminals who think they're better than they are. And, and it's been known that death row inmates... Uh, will often justify their actions. Uh, people in the prison system will say, well, I haven't done what that guy did. And, and you get down to sort of the, the bottom tier of the hierarchy and, and a guy who is to be executed who says, well, I haven't done X, Y, Z. There's, there's always something else that's worse as a method of self-justifying criminal behavior. And Proverbs 30, 20 is, is an example of that. Uh, obvious foolish living. And she says, I've done nothing wrong. Turn to Deuteronomy 29. We'll step out of the, the book of Proverbs for a few moments. Deuteronomy 29, 19. This is the discussion of, of blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. And Moses says, it will be when he hears the words of this curse, that he will bless himself in his heart, saying, I have peace, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart, in order to sweep away the watered land with the dry. This is one who has chosen to not go God's way, and who says, I'm going to be okay, even though I have a stubborn heart. And the text says, and he blesses his own heart. He, he declares a blessing of happiness upon his own life. In spite of his stubbornness. Listen to Jeremiah 17.5. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from Yahweh. 
there the contrast is, is between, will I trust Yahweh or will I trust human resources? You could put your own mind, your own resources, your own flesh into that trusting mankind and trusting flesh. There is a place to entrust ourselves to others who are flesh, to trust the opinions of others, to submit ourselves to wise and godly counsel. We'll get to that in a moment. But in the end, all of that is a trust in Yahweh. Even when we entrust ourselves to others who are flawed, we are entrusting ourselves to Yahweh. The anti-authoritarian is the one who says, I do not trust Yahweh and I do not trust his means for wisdom, for accountability of my own self-trust. I will go my way. Luke 18, 9. Jesus tells the parable of the publican, the tax collector, and the Pharisee. And the parable is introduced this way. Jesus says, or, or Luke records that Jesus told this parable to people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they viewed others with contempt. And the parable ends with the summary statement. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went to his house justified. The, the tax collector who said, woe is me, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me, Lord. He went to his house declared righteous by God rather than the other who said, I thank you, God, that I don't sin like that guy. And Jesus goes on to say, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And Jesus there makes the link between sinful pride that will be humiliated and self-trust, which manifests that pride. In the letter to the Romans, Paul writes in Romans 12, 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind. Associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Listen, it's, it's easy to be convinced by history. If you were right about something that one time, to project that forward into your own judgments and assessments. Listen, I, I think we ought to be building wisdom. We ought to be renewing our minds according to the Word of God. And, and to the degree that our minds conform to the Word of God, there is wisdom there. But our trust is in the Word of God. We still must maintain a healthy distrust of self. Have I got the Word of God right? Have I applied it correctly in this situation? Am I reading this person correctly? Am I applying God's wisdom from this principle to this life these things are difficult to do, and if we are wise in our own estimation because of past successes, we'll be humbled by our application of self-trust going forward. Turn to Jeremiah 17. I quoted a minute, a minute ago from Jeremiah 17, 5, cursed is the man who trusts in mankind. But a few verses down is a familiar text. Jeremiah 17, 9. And the prophet says this, the heart, that is the internal command and control center of the human constitution. This is your brain. This is your feelings, right? This is your intellect, emotion, and will. It's the entire inner you that, that, that drives you, the heart. The heart is more deceitful than all else. It's a strong statement. Think of all the deceitful things out there. Put your heart at the top of the list. And it's desperately sick. Who can know it? I, Yahweh, search the heart, I test the inmost being, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. And what this text reminds us is this disease, this internal infection at the command and control center of who we are, whose effects must be mitigated by getting outside of ourselves, by having a fundamental distrust of self, by not relying on intuition, but filtering everything through the Word of God and through the wisdom of others. 
Well, let's think about Jeremiah 17, 9 for a moment and, and go back to the thoughts in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust Yahweh with all your heart. The heart is desperately sick, so don't trust that. Trust Yahweh with all your heart. Don't trust yourself. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. That's wonderful wisdom. There's a question for us with this ditty. It, 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 I think we've seen in our little survey here, it, it, it's not isolated, this prohibition against trusting self. Um, it, it, it's actually life-saving instruction. At a gospel level, at an eternal state level, you have to abandon self-trust in order to get in. And in the course of life, you have to abandon self-trust in order to succeed. But an important question arises for us. Does Jeremiah 17.9 apply to a believer in Jesus Christ? Or does Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 apply to a believer in Jesus Christ? And maybe you're thinking, well, of course it does. It's in my Bible. I'm a believer and I'm reading it. It should apply. But here's a place sometimes we get tripped up. You know the language of the new covenant. In Deuteronomy 30, it's circumcise your hearts. In Jeremiah 31, it is God says, I will give them a new heart. In Ezekiel 36 and 37, I will sprinkle their hearts clean with clean water. Uh, a reference to the Holy Spirit, regeneration, repentance, renewal, new birth. And so we can think by sort of logical deduction that I have a new heart. I'm, I'm a new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The old has gone and the new has come. The old stuff was a corrupted heart. Now I have a new heart. So I can trust it. And furthermore, this heart has been circumcised supernaturally by a, an invisible work of the Holy Spirit inside me. And so my command and control center has been surgically altered. Or you get to the language of a new heart in Jeremiah 31. The, the old is gone, the new has come. The old, dirty, untrustable heart has been replaced by a new Disney, trustworthy heart. I can follow it. And I, I just, I can appreciate the logical deduction. God promised he'd give a new heart. Why would he give me something bad? Why would he give me something I can't trust? But I think what we're doing when we make this logical deduction is we are mixing biblical metaphors in a really unhelpful way that actually lead us to violate a critical biblical principle. When you think about your new heart, Christian, uh, recognize that, that fundamentally we as Gentiles are appropriating promises God made to Israel for the new covenant, which is not yet fulfilled. It won't be fulfilled until they're in the land. It won't be fulfilled until Messiah reigns on David's throne. And the entire nation of Israel gets circumcised hearts, Deuteronomy 30, New hearts, Jeremiah 31, sprinkled clean hearts, Ezekiel 36 and 37. And when Jesus lifted up, a, up the cup at the Last Supper, he said, Behold, this is the blood of the cup. It represents the new covenant poured out for you. And for you, he's talking to 11 Jews in the upper room who will be inheritors of those new covenant promises, literally. But then in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul applies this practice of remembering Jesus' death at the Lord's table, a celebration of the new covenant, which will be literally fulfilled as a regular rehearsal and practice of remembrance for the church, Jews and Gentiles together. Now, that's a long lead up to a punchline. Here's the punchline. Gentiles who believe in Christ get to participate now in the spiritual blessings of the new covenant while we await the fulfillment of the new covenant that come with not only spiritual blessings, but national blessings to Israel, blessings to the world, land promises, and Messiah's reign. I know that was a theological mouthful. But, but just know we are borrowing new heart language, not from Proverbs or even from the New Testament related to issues of self-trust. We're 
We're borrowing language from God's inviolable promises to Israel that by His grace we get to participate in. It's not a statement about our ontology, our makeup, who we are, what constitutes us, and how the human heart works. It is a promise that we will be fulfilled in a day when the people who follow Messiah will love Him sincerely and from the heart. That's great news. There has been a change in you, Christian. You're a new creature. But the newness that we're going to, to think about is a newness described in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It's a newness described in places like Romans 6. The old man no longer exists. And the newness of resurrection life in Christ you walk in. There's our old and new categories we need to think about. And what is new for you in the Christian life is new by addition, not by replacement. What's new for you in the Christian life is new by addition, not by absolute total replacement. That just means you're in a mixed condition. It means that you bring with you tendencies, habits, patterns, uh, what Dr. Zemeck called the homardiological hangovers of your former Christless life. That is the, the residue of sin, the, the residual film of your godless state. Now, that will be eradicated when you're glorified. In a resurrected body, you will no longer be able to sin. But you're new, Christian, in the sense that you're not what you were. You're not yet what you will be. But you're in this weird state now where you still sin out of your nature. It's not like you have a new heart and, in the, and before you were a Christian, sin came out of your heart. But, but now that you have a new heart, it comes from someone else. Blame it on the devil. Blame it on your little sister. Blame it on your circumstances. But it's not my heart. My heart's trustworthy. That's not the biblical picture at all. You don't have grounds in the Christian life to start trusting yourself like a fool. And so going back to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Proverbs is written not as an evangelistic text. Do you understand that? Proverbs is written by God through the human author giving wisdom to the people who will put themselves under God's wisdom. And what is the wisdom for God's people seeking to live out wisdom? Trust Yahweh, don't trust yourself. This, this is not a, a verse for how do I become a Christian? How do I come, become the people of God? This is a verse for how do I live out God's wisdom as one fearing him. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. And living under his grace, living under his banner, living according to his name, carrying about with me his name. How do I live? And the positive command, trust Yahweh with everything you got. And the prohibition, don't trust yourself. This stands for the Christian in a mixed condition. Don't do the logical deduction where you say, well, I have a new heart, so now I can trust it. Now I can follow it. So if I can't trust me, who can I trust? <laughs> I mean, doesn't this apply to the guy sitting next to me? Doesn't this apply to my husband? Doesn't this apply to my parents? I mean, if I can't trust me, they can't trust them, I shouldn't trust them either. We can get there pretty quick. And again, this is part of the sickness, this is part of the internal dilemma. We give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. We, we trust ourselves and we distrust the opinions of others. It's just natural. It's just what we do. It, it's like when Jesus says, you need to love others as you love yourself. That gets misheard, doesn't it, in our day? Well, I, I can't really love others until I stand firmly on the platform of self-love. That, that's not what Jesus is saying at all. It's a concession. You already love yourself too much. And, and wouldn't it be great if your love for others got somewhere in the same neighborhood as your self-love? 
self-trust is, is similar. We, we just do this naturally. So let's just think about some ways that we need to distrust ourselves and then what's the remedy? The, the, the first remedy, of course, is Romans 12, 2. Romans 12, 2, I like to think of as the, the New Testament version of Psalm 1. And if you were here on Sunday night, uh, a, month or, a month ago or so, in Psalm 1, we learned not to stand, walk, or sit in the ideas, the worldviews, the pathways of the wicked, those who are opposed to God. Rather, we are to delight ourselves in God's word. Romans 12, 2, sort of the New Testament counterpart to that, says, do not be conformed to this world, but positively be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may approve what the will of God is, that which is good and pleasing and perfect. What must we get? God's will, flawless, perfect. How do we get it? From him, from his word. We, we want our thoughts to mimic his. We want to think God's thoughts after him. Therefore, we must be in this ongoing, continual practice of renewing our minds. If you distrust yourself, you will be in the regular habit of opening God's word and say, God, I, you never lie. I've got problems. I've got to rethink these things. Feed me. Renew my mind. Change the way I think. And listen, to the degree that you neglect the regular discipline of intake of God's word, by reading, by listening to it, by hearing it taught, and then by following through, by repeating it to others, you, you tend to keep what you give away. By tucking away in your heart, by committing it to memory. If you fail in the regular discipline of the intake of God's word, you will be left to your own devices. You'll be left to your own thoughts. And if you're anything like me, I have forgotten more than I have learned. More, uh, see, I even forgot how the phrase goes. I forget. I can't trust my own memories. And things that I learned once go out and I need to learn them again. So the regular daily discipline of coming to God's word is the fundamental way to get out of self-trust and into trust of Yahweh. Another avenue for this is to trust godly counsel. Look at Proverbs 11. Proverbs 11:14 says, "Where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselors there is salvation." There are so many ways that the world has picked up on this bit of wisdom. Uh, if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat its mistakes. Uh, there's a reason that we don't reinvent structural engineering every generation. <laughs> there are mistakes that have been made that we learn from and we don't make those mistakes again. Uh, we listen to the counsel of those who have succeeded in the past. Uh, we, we, we look to those who have done well. Uh, when I say trust godly counsel, I just mean there is a, a pragmatic benefit to taking counsel from others who are good at what they do. In, in a worldly sense, uh, who do I want to learn how to dribble a basketball from? Um, not me. Michael Jordan or, or someone else who has mastered the art. Proverbs 15, 22. Again, the, the writer of Proverbs is having us get outside of ourselves here. He writes, without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. By the way, the benefit of getting many is there are potentially divergent opinions. There are good opinions and bad opinions. And, and the more you get by law of averages, maybe you'll get to a better answer. Proverbs 24, 6 says, by guidance, you make war. And in an abundance of counselors, there is salvation. In our nation's military history, the best successes have come 
when those steeped in military history and military strategy were allowed to call the shots on a battlefield. Abject failure has happened when one guy at the top is calling the shots and he doesn't know what he's doing. That illustration is poignant. Lives are at stake. A multiplicity of counselors doesn't guarantee good outcomes, however. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 12. When I say you need to trust godly counsel, I mean that it's not a guarantee that, it's you, that if you have a multiplicity of counselors, you'll get to the right answer or make the right conclusions. If you're walking the halls of your junior high school and asking your fellow junior hires, hey, what do I need to do to be ready for high school? I, I think you're fundamentally flawed in your approach. If you're walking around the halls of your high school and you're saying, hey, guys, what's life all about? How should I order my priorities? How should I dress? What should I study? What should I pursue? Who should I date? <laughs> I think you've got a lot of fundamentally flawed approaches to life. Asking your peers is not usually the best strategy. Get outside of your situation. Uh, read books to get outside of your century. Get outside of, of your immediate comrades who think like you think. Maybe swimming in the same shallow pool of information or even in the same folly or rebellion. This is the tragic story of Rehoboam in 1 Kings 12. This is after Solomon's death and, and you know this is the, the beginning of the split of the kingdom between the tribes of Israel. Rehoboam became king in Solomon's place. Chapter 12, verse 1, Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. And it happened when Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard of it, he was living in Egypt. He was yet in Egypt where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon. They sent and called for him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke harsh, but you lighten the harsh service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us, and we will serve you. And he said to them, go away for three days, return to me. So the people went away. And you think, well, this is good. He's going to think about it. He listened to their request. He's, he's going to take some counsel. Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the elders who had stood before his father Solomon, an older generation outside of his peer group. And he says, how do you counsel me to respond to this people? And they spoke to him saying, if you will be a servant to this people today and you will serve them, grant them their petition, speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. Verse 8. But he forsook the counsel of the elders which they had counseled him. He took counsel with the young men who grew up with him and stood before him. So he said to them, what counsel do you give that we may respond to this people who have spoken to me? Saying, lighten the yoke which your father put on us. And the young men who grew up with him spoke to him saying, thus you shall say to this people who spoke to you saying, your father made our yoke heavy, now make it light for us. Thus you shall speak to them. My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. So now my father loaded you with a heavy yoke. I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips. I will discipline you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day as the king had spoken saying, return to me on the third day. The king answered the people harshly. He forsook the counsel of the elders which they had given him, and he spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, I'll add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, I'll discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people. This was a turn of events from Yahweh, so that he might establish his word, which he spoke. God had promised a divided kingdom because of the sin in the Davidic line. And now that sin comes to fruition. But it comes to fruition through the rebellious means of a kid who trusted himself and his peers. Did he get counsel? He didn't listen to godly counsel. He didn't listen to wise counsel. He got a multiplicity of counselors and he failed. And the consequences for him, for his life, for the nation, and all those under his reign is perhaps incalculable. What do you need in your life? Proven godly examples. 
You need to find those people who love Christ and love him well and walk faithfully in obedience to him, who, whose lives bear fruit. And you say, as, as far as you're following Christ, I want to follow you. Paul himself actually encouraged that kind of imitation. Find those people in your life. Your, your best friends are, are the ones who will give you wise counsel, not the things you want to hear. Not, hey, uh, you can have power, you can get what you want if you don't serve these people. Uh, you're king, you're in charge. And by the way, if you follow our advice, we'll be with you for the party in the palace while everybody else suffers. Don't listen to those guys. Listen to those who will tell you something challenging. Honor the Lord. Honor your father. Serve the people from your leadership role. This kid didn't want to hear that. If you want to be wise, put yourself under people who are telling you hard truths rather than easy lies. Put yourself under your parents, kids. You put yourselves under godly leaders in the local church, Hebrews 13, 17. You put yourself under the wisdom of godly women and godly men who have faithfully followed Christ for a long time. That's the pattern of women's ministry in Titus 2. It's the pattern of older men teaching younger men and modeling humility. We ought to put ourselves in places where we trust others, where we distrust ourselves enough to get counsel from others. And to be wise in our seeking of that counsel. An area of trust that's critical for us is to trust God's commands. Come to something in scripture. You come to a positive command or a negative prohibition. Just do what God says. This is a fundamental issue of faith. Faith and obedience are related. They're not at odds with one another. Obedience just says, God, you know what you're doing. I don't know how to order my life. In fact, when the Mosaic law was given to the people of Israel, God made an appeal through Moses to the nation. What other the nation is there that has such a great set of regulations? And sometimes you think, man, they can't eat BLTs. That doesn't sound good. The point of all the Mosaic regulations was to highlight that God is unique and he uniquely set his affections on Israel and they were to think about it every time they plowed their fields, put on their clothes or picked up a fork to eat their lunch. And God loved them and set up these regulations, even the tabernacle and sacrificial regulations, so that he could be close to them and they not be destroyed. He's a gracious God who not only reveals himself to his people, but then regulates their lives for his good. You come to New Testament regulations, same principle applies. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you keep my commandments, then I will disclose myself to you, Jesus said in John 14. I will abide with you. In other words, life, blessing, happiness, closeness to God, everything we really want. If we will trust him by entrusting ourselves with our lives under his commands. We also learn to trust God's promises. And, and this is where it gets hard. God makes a promise. It's not yet fulfilled. And what happens in the meantime? We wait. Waiting on the Lord is trust multiplied by time. And that's hard. It's hard to trust the Lord when your circumstances don't change. It's hard sometimes to believe God's promises when what's happening right now is not the full fulfillment of those promises. And so we wait. We trust Him. We also trust God's ways in particularly mystifying moments. God's up to something in our lives. God's up to something in our difficulties. I don't know what he's doing. He, he doesn't tell us everything that he's doing. We get to read the book of Job. God was doing something for all of us to read about. Something about his own character. Something about the nature and malevolence of Satan. Satan. And something about the work of God in the heart of a man, like Job. I think the fundamental premise of that whole scene is not even Satan can undo a work that God begins in the heart of a man. Now, Job didn't know any of that. 
He just loses everything. Scraping boils with pot shards off his arm while his wife is telling him to curse God and die. Life is hard. The circumstances mystifying. Of course, Job's life takes a turn at the end. We, we read about that. We, we read about the turn of his perspective. We get into the 40s of Job. But in this life, Job never saw the behind the scenes. The work of God, his interactions with Satan, his proof to Satan and to all of us reading the book of Job about his work in Job's heart, Job never knew. I don't know if he's read the book since he's been in heaven. There's probably better things to do. Job answered Yahweh, verse 3, chapter 40. I am insignificant. What can I respond to you? I place my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, I will not answer. Even twice, and I will add nothing more. Job here does not trust himself to assess the situation. And he said a lot of things before chapter 40. And his friends said a lot of things before chapter 40. They trusted themselves. And and it's not until God reveals himself, we all breathe a sigh of relief. Okay, good. Somebody besides these knuckleheads is talking and it's God talking and we can trust him. And if you've read through Job in your Bible reading plan, and you've thought, is this ever going to end? Why, why am I reading about all these convoluted conversations where people don't know what's going on? And part of that is by God's design to get us to the, the tension that builds up to the sigh of relief when God speaks. Turn to chapter 42. Job answered Yahweh and said, I know you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand. Things too marvelous for me, which I did not know. Hear now and I will speak. I will ask you and you make me know. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Now my eye sees you. Therefore, I reject myself and I repent in dust and ashes. The, the glorious end of Job's spiritual turn from the heart is self-distrust and trust in Yahweh. So we trust God's ways in mystifying moments. Spurgeon said it this way, trust him when you cannot trace him. And we trust God's means. God uses means, imperfect authorities, Romans 13. Well, I really can't trust the government. Yes, but you can trust God who's behind the government and holds it accountable. So obey him. Pay your taxes. Do what they say to do until they tell you to do something you shouldn't do. Until they tell you to not do something you should do. In every other circumstance, trust the Lord. Kids, you can trust God's dealings with you through your imperfect parents. If you leave this message and you go home and you said, Smed said from up front that you're imperfect. You missed the point. (laughs) Grant that they're not perfect and trust God in their parenting of you. And then finally, trust God in trials. We don't assess them correctly. And one of God's purposes in our trials is to dislodge self-trust. Listen to 2 Corinthians 1.9. Paul writes, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but trust in God who raises the dead. Let's pray. Lord, we, we find ourselves with your word open before us and our hearts open before you, needing to cast ourselves upon you in faith again, asking for help. Dislodging self-trust is a monumental task and we're not adequate for it. We ask for your help. We depend upon your work by your spirit to grow us in this. We implicitly trust you. You're trustworthy. Never has a word of yours fallen to the ground. And so many times our words have. It it seems totally logical and appropriate to abandon self-trust and to trust you. And yet you know our frame. 
you know our hearts and you know how we struggle here. So we ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen.